Now that the Russians have seen what a real coup looks like, it's a good opportunity to talk about the topic more. The Revolution of Dignity, also known as the Euromaidan, was the turning point in Ukraine's history. Protests launched in late 2013 in response to the U-turn of the pro-Russian Yanukovych administration to sign an association agreement with the EU turned into a revolution in the winter of 2014, leading to the change of the regime and an aggressive reaction from Russia, culminating in the unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. The Russian propaganda and some observers around the world call the Euromaidan a coup, basically an armed takeover of the elected government in Ukraine. In this video, we will describe the events of the Revolution of Dignity and try to find out if it really was a revolution, or as Russian propaganda claims, a coup. Getting to the bottom of such questions is one thing, but getting what we discover onto the screen for all of you is another, so we'd like to thank our sponsor Skillshare for their help and extend a special offer from them to you. Skillshare is a platform for taking lessons in all kinds of creative skills. Be it painting, music, crafts, or even the business side of creative life, there are loads of classes available from expert teachers. But the best thing for us is all their courses on making videos. After all, doing visual effects can be daunting even for basic things like making a custom text animation. Skillshare helped us with loads of classes on the skills happening behind the scenes at KNG, such as this course on Adobe After Effects about making motion graphics. Programs like these can be mastered through classes like this, we can guarantee you of that. Whatever it is you want to get better at in your creative life, or if you want to take a skill you have and turn it into a business, find the relevant classes on Skillshare for an immediate head start and guidance right up to the pro level. If you want to see for yourself, get Skillshare with our link in the description fast, because the first thousand people to use that link get a month of Skillshare for free. Get in there quick. Ever since Ukraine gained its independence in 1991, following the demise of the Soviet Union, this Eastern European nation stood at the crossroads in terms of its strategic foreign policy course, integrating with Europe or maintaining close relations with Russia. This became the main issue of the political, cultural and geographical divide in Ukraine, and the issue has been the cause of the biggest political mobilization processes in the history of independent Ukraine, even prior to the Euromaidan. In 2004, the pro-European candidate Viktor Yushchenko ran for the presidency against the Russian-backed Viktor Yanukovych, and following electoral fraud, Yushchenko's supporters took to the streets to demand free and fair elections, and ultimately a European choice for Ukraine. Mass protests, known as the Orange Revolution, eventually led to the repeat of the second round of presidential elections, ending in Yushchenko's victory. His term is remembered for the creation of closer ties with Europe, while relations with Russia soured, culminating in several gas disputes. But Yushchenko was unable to curb the endemic corruption and improve the living standards of ordinary Ukrainians, and as a result, he came only fifth in the 2010 presidential election, which his old rival Yanukovych won. During his presidency, Yanukovych had been accused of repressions against his political opponents and the independent media parochialism and very high levels of corruption, he and his family benefiting personally. But despite being known for his pro-Russian stance, Yanukovych continued on the path of integration with the European Union. On the 30th of March 2012, the EU association agreement was initiated by Kyiv and Brussels. Despite problems associated with the arrest of the former Prime Minister of Ukraine, and its main opposition figure, Yulia Tymoshenko, on corruption charges, and in general, questions regarding Ukraine's human rights record, the talks on the association agreement progressed between the sides. According to the poll conducted in December 2011 by the Ilko Kucherev Democratic Initiatives Foundation, prior to the Euromaidan revolution, 46% of Ukrainians supported Ukraine's accession to the EU, while 33% were against it. Western and northern provinces of the country, which have traditionally voted in favour of pro-Western politicians and parties in prior elections, were predominantly for the EU membership, while southern and eastern regions, including Donbass and Crimea, strongholds of Yanukovych and his pro-Russian party of the regions, were mostly against this, preferring closer ties with Russia. While the level of public support for the EU accession of Ukraine was by no means overwhelming, Almost half the population was in favour of this. 
The progress in negotiations was considerable, and the expectation was that Ukraine was going to sign the EU Association Agreement at the Vilnius Summit in November 2013. But complicated processes were going on in the background, as Yanukovych worked on improving the terms of the deal with the EU and the IMF, persuading his pro-Russian party of the benefits of closer integration with Europe, while trying to appease Russia at the same time. Needless to say, this was a very difficult task, which Yanukovych absolutely botched. It is more than evident now that the Kremlin sees Ukraine not as an independent state, but as its own backyard. Hence Putin was extremely unhappy with Yanukovych, who was supposed to be his ally, choosing Europe over Russia. In 2013, Russia increased gas prices for Ukraine and started blocking sales of Ukrainian-produced meat, cheese and some other food products, along with abolishing the duty-free regime for steel pipes. Decades of existence within the Soviet Union had made Ukraine's industry very closely aligned with Russia, particularly in Donbass, the base of Yanukovych's Party of Regions. Thus, bans on the import of Ukrainian-made produce were a significant problem for Ukraine to say the least. The then Prime Minister of Ukraine, Mykola Azarov, claimed that Ukraine had lost almost $7 billion in exports due to Russia-imposed restrictions. According to Reuters, in September 2013, just two months before the intended signing of the EU Association Agreement, Yanukovych gathered the party elite in Kyiv to share his plans of closer integration with Europe. Many prominent party members, who were also business owners and industry chiefs in Donbass, were concerned that their businesses would suffer as a result of the Kremlin's trade war. They complained about the harm that Yanukovych's decision will inflict on eastern Ukraine. The then president of Ukraine reportedly responded, forget about it, forever. Yanukovych brushed aside all the complaints, declaring his goal to his party members, we will pursue integration with Europe. A former member of the Party of Regions, Inna Bohoslovka, told Reuters that during this meeting, Viktor Yanukovych criticized Russia for not seeing Ukraine as an equal and for trying to take advantage of Ukraine. But Yanukovych did not deem terms offered by Europe suitable either. According to Reuters, Yanukovych estimated that Ukraine would need $160 billion in three years to survive the harm inflicted by the trade ban from Russia and losses from reforms requested by the EU. But the EU was ready to offer only 610 million euros. An EU source told Reuters that had Ukraine signed the association agreement and reached an understanding with the IMF, Kyiv would have received at least 19 billion euros, but this money was never mentioned to Ukrainian representatives. Ukraine's permanent representative for NATO during the Yanukovych era, Vladimir Olenik, claimed that the IMF was ready to offer only 5 billion in loans, part of which would have been used to pay previous loans. Furthermore, there was a matter of Yulia Tymoshenko, the imprisoned opposition leader hated by Yanukovych, whose release was demanded by the EU as a condition of signing the association agreement. But while the European terms had been deemed harsh by the Ukrainian government of the time, the main cause of Yanukovych's U-turn was Russia's pressure. On November 9, 2013, less than 20 days before the supposed day of the signing of the EU Association Agreement, Yanukovych secretly met with Putin. Then, on November 20, the Prime Minister Azarov met with his Russian colleague Dmitry Medvedev in St. Petersburg. We do not know exactly what the sides talked about in these meetings, but a day later, on November 21, Yanukovych declared that Ukraine would not sign the association agreement. According to the foreign policy advisor to the Lithuanian president, Yevita Nelipsiene, Yanukovych called the Lithuanian president before announcing his decision, stating that Ukraine was in no position to resist the Russian economic pressure and blackmail. Earlier, Armenia backed off from signing the association agreement under pressure from Russia, opting to join the Kremlin-led Eurasian Customs Union instead. Yanukovych's U-turn came as a shock to Ukrainian society, which thought of the signing of the association agreement as a foregone conclusion. On the same day, journalists Mustafa Nayem and Yuri Andreev, along with one of the opposition leaders, Arseniy Yatsenuk, called people to gather at the iconic Maidan Nezalezhnosti, the Independence Square. A few thousand people, mostly the youth, gathered in central Kyiv. Soon, opposition parties started to join as well, on November 24th, tens of thousands gathered at the Maidan. For nine days, 
Protests demanding integration with Europe and the resignation of the government were mostly peaceful, but on the night of November 30th, Burkut special police units violently dispersed a few hundred people remaining at the protest area. In hindsight, the violent response by the Yanukovych regime was a miscalculation, as it gave impetus to the protest movement, the size of which was modest by Ukrainian standards before that. In response, the main opposition parties established the headquarters of national resistance. The process started gathering revolutionary momentum. On December 1st, a huge crowd of hundreds of thousands gathered in downtown Kyiv. Soon clashes ensued, and the most radical elements in the crowd fought with the riot police near the presidential administration. Then the protesters occupied the Kyiv city council and the trade union's building. The day ended with speeches of the opposition leaders condemning the attack on the presidential administration, along with calling for a national strike and the resignation of Yanukovych. The tent city, akin to the one in the Orange Revolution, started being constructed in central Kyiv. Barricades were erected. For several days after the December 1st clashes, protests spread to several western Ukrainian cities like Lviv and Ternopil, while in Kyiv, Protesters attempted to block several government buildings, but overall the situation remained stable. Rumors about Yanukovych's intention to join the Eurasian Customs Union circled, which further fueled public dissatisfaction. On December 8th, another massive demonstration took place in central Kyiv, the culmination of which was the destruction of Lenin's monument by the activists of the Nationalist Party Svoboda. While Yanukovych was seeking a way out of the crisis by meeting the EU representatives and holding a roundtable meeting with all former presidents of Ukraine, his riot police were clashing with protesters to dismantle their barricades and tents. But this news only mobilized the public, as the barricades were reinstated almost immediately after the riot police left. Talks between Yanukovych, the opposition leaders and civil society representatives did not lead to any positive results. The signing of the Ukrainian-Russian Action Plan on December 17th only exacerbated tensions. Protests and clashes in central Kyiv continued for several more weeks, when on January 16th, the Yanukovych administration pushed on to adopt draconian anti-protest laws. Instead of calming the situation down, it ultimately gave another push to the protest movement and made the matters worse for the government. On January 19th, Hundreds of thousands gathered in central Kyiv on a Sunday, in open defiance of the new law. Heavy clashes between protesters and the riot police near Frushevsky Street continued for three days. On January 21st to 22nd, the protest movement reached the point of no return, when the news of the death of three protesters emerged. Two of them were killed by shots fired by the police. Things started spiralling out of control as violent scenes in Kyiv and images of tortured protesters showed the level of crisis occurring in Ukraine. The Ministry of Internal Affairs accused the opposition of stockpiling firearms in the occupied buildings of the Kyiv City Hall and House of Trade Unions. Yanukovych once again met with the opposition leaders and offered Yatsenyuk the position of Prime Minister, along with promising to consider constitutional amendments decreasing the powers of the President. This was followed by the rollback of some of the anti-protest laws, along with the resignation of the Azarov government. But along with attempting to appease the opposition by offering half measures, the Yanukovych administration continued repressions against protesters. The attempts of the US government and the EU officials to broker a solution between the government and the opposition did not lead to any fruition either, as the opposition demanded immediate constitutional reform while the government refused to offer amnesty to all detained protesters. Still, after the protest movement agreed to unblock key Kyiv roads and vacate occupied administrative buildings, the government adopted a law on amnesty. But the most dramatic events of the Revolution of Dignity were yet to come. On February 18th, protesters marched on the Ukrainian parliament building, where they were met with police resistance. Chaos ensued in central Kyiv, as it resembled a scene of battle. Police used live ammunition, rubber bullets, stun grenades and other tools against the protesters, who retaliated with Molotov cocktails and set the barricades and then the building of the Party of Regions on fire. Dozens of protesters and policemen died in clashes on that day. The government-funded provocateurs, known as Tetushki, also took part in attacks against protesters, 
reportedly shooting one of them dead on February 19th. On the following day, more people died in clashes, mostly protesters killed by sniper fire, as the death toll reached 42 people. The Minister of Interior, Zakachenko, admitted that combat weapons had been given to the police, citing the capture of several riot policemen and the necessity to conduct an anti-terrorist operation to release them. Foreign ministers of Germany, France and Poland met with Yanukovych, who apparently agreed to hold presidential and parliamentary elections in the immediate future, and create a government of national unity until then. Putin also sent his envoy, Vladimir Lukin, to organize talks between the government and the opposition. Around the same time, one of the leaders of the Party of Regions, Alexander Yefremov, traveled to Luhansk, calling for secession or federalization of Ukraine if Yanukovych fails to stabilize the situation. The chairman of the Crimean parliament, Konstantinov, went to Moscow to call for the secession of Crimea from Ukraine in case of a power change in Ukraine. At the time, these statements may have looked unrealistic, but they ended up being a harbinger of things to come. The situation was getting worse for Yanukovych. His party of regions started to crumble as some of its elected members left the party. The deputy chief of staff of the Ukrainian army resigned in protest for attempting to use the army in internal affairs after Yanukovych dismissed the chief of staff under unclear circumstances, but probably for the same reason. Separate police units started joining the protest. On February 21st, in the last-ditch attempt to save his power, Yanukovych signed the Agreement on the Settlement of the Political Crisis in Ukraine, brokered by German, French and Polish foreign ministers, and observed by the Russian representative with three opposition leaders. The agreement stipulated the return of the 2004 constitution, which envisaged decreased presidential powers, along with the formation of the Government of National Trust to oversee presidential elections to be held in 2014. The government would remove the law enforcement from central Kyiv, while the opposition would surrender all arms in its possession. Still, several leaders of the Euromaidan movement, not linked to the opposition parties, rejected the agreement, stating that protests would continue until the resignation of Yanukovych. But they did not have to wait for long. Very soon, the riot police guarding Yanukovych's residence and government buildings left. Prominent figures of the Yanukovych government started to flee Kyiv. By February 22nd, Yanukovych had left too. The parliament voted to reinstate the 2004 constitution and impeached Yanukovych. The prominent opposition figure Alexander Turchinov was elected the chairman of the parliament and the acting president until the election of a new president. The revolution of dignity had won. 107 protesters and 13 policemen died during clashes in central Kyiv. In the future, we will talk about the events that transpired in the aftermath of the revolution in Ukraine, including the illegal annexation of Crimea and the start of the Russian-backed separatist movement in eastern Ukraine, which eventually escalated into a full-scale war. For now, let's go back to the question of our video. Was the Euromaidan a revolution or a coup? The Western political establishment, most of the Western media and political commentators see the Euromaidan as a revolution, as the struggle of the Ukrainian people against a corrupt leader who did not mind shooting his own people. In contrast, Russia has been actively cultivating the narrative that the Euromaidan was actually an armed coup by the Ukrainian far right, backed by the West against a legitimate leader of the country. Many Western far-right and far-left pundits and commentators share this opinion. To tackle this question, we need to first agree on what a coup is. Is there a generally accepted definition of a coup? American political scientist Samuel Huntingdon says that the coup d'etat is an effort by political leaders to seize state power illegally, and to state power must be added the control of the means of coercion, power over the army and the police. His Spanish colleague, Juan J. Lintz, proposes a similar definition. A coup d'etat is an illegal and overt attempt by the military or other elites within the state apparatus to unseat the sitting executive authority, resulting in a change of the chief executive. Almost all definitions of coup include the component of the military or ruling elite as the force behind the coercive ouster of the incumbent government. In Ukraine, neither the military nor any groups in the government supported Euromaidan. On the contrary, 
Yanukovych employed riot police and all available security services, including the SBU and government-funded Tatushki, to quell the protests. The police and the SBU followed Yanukovych's orders and stayed loyal to him until the end. His attempt to use the army as the last resort to defeat the Euromaidan was unsuccessful. But it does not mean that the army somehow sided with the protesters. Instead, it refused to shoot at fellow Ukrainians and decided to stay out of the civilian conflict. But there are other definitions, which include the component of public movements, opposition parties, or the level of popular support, as an important element of coups. For instance, according to political scientist Roger Peterson, coup d'etat occurs when members of the opposition and or popular movements, either with or without military support, forcibly overthrow the sitting government. It implies the use of force, if not by the military, then by the opposition. So while opposition overthrowing a government may qualify as a coup under this definition, it must use coercion in this process, otherwise any velvet revolution would qualify as a coup under this definition as well. Let's look at some of the main talking points of those who argue that the Euromaidan was a coup. Their first argument is that violent and armed protesters, backed by the West, have overthrown a legitimate government. But as we have described above, initially the protests were quite small and would have eventually died down naturally had the government avoided drastic measures. But the violent dispersal of young people angered many others, pushing them to take to the streets and expand their demands beyond integration with Europe. Still, the government insisted on solving the conflict with the public through violence, forcing some of the protesters to respond with Molotov cocktails and other improvised tools. The Ukrainian Minister of Interior admitted that lethal weapons had been given to the police, who used them on February 20th against the public, killing dozens of people. A small minority of protesters fought back with air guns and traumatic pistols. It is difficult to expect the whole crowd of protesters to remain peaceful when the government regularly uses violence against them. One of the key points of this narrative is the sniper activity in Kyiv on February 19th to 20th. Russian propaganda claims that these snipers were employed by the opposition to create chaos, further destabilize the situation, and make the continuation of Yanukovych's reign impossible. This claim is based on the sole argument that a Ukrainian doctor named Olha Bohomolitz said that the wounds of both protesters and policemen indicate that they were attacked by the same shooters. First, Bohomolitz is a doctor, not a forensic expert, so she lacked the expertise that would allow her to come to this conclusion. As she said in her interview with The Telegraph, no one who just sees the wounds when treating the victims can make a determination about the type of weapons. Second, Bohomolitz has denied in the same interview that she treated any policeman and had seen their wounds. Myself, I only saw protesters. In former Soviet countries, policemen, members of security forces and servicemen are typically treated in state hospitals designated for them specifically, particularly when injuries occur while on duty. So the sniper argument does not hold up, and there's no evidence to suggest that they were not employed by the government but by the opposition. Another argument is that the Yanukovych regime had been overthrown by agents of the West in Ukraine. The best way to debunk this assertion is to look at the February 21st agreement and the earlier attempts of the EU to negotiate a solution. Of course, the EU wanted Ukraine to sign the association agreement in 2013. But at the time when Kyiv started resembling a battlefield, their main intention was to find a peaceful solution to the conflict. The EU did not force Yanukovych to resign. They actually mediated an agreement with the opposition, which would see Yanukovych remain as the president until snap elections whose participation in them was not prohibited by this agreement. But the anger of the protest movement towards Yanukovych, due to a series of violent crackdowns on protesters, pushed them to reject the agreement and call for a struggle until Yanukovych could be overthrown. Evidently against the wishes of the EU, which was behind the February 21st agreement. What about the United States? The State Department official Victoria Newland had made several visits to the Maidan Nezalezhnosti and openly supported the protest movement. Her phone call with the American ambassador to Kyiv leaked to the internet where they discussed the potential composition of the new government and in which Newland famously said, F the EU, and had been used by the Russian propagandist as an apparent proof of the American hand being behind the protest movement. The White House spokesperson Jen Psaki rejected this premise, stating that, 
It shouldn't be a surprise that at any point there have been discussions about recent events and offers and what is happening on the ground, which makes sense. In one of her speeches, Newland noted that the US had allocated $5 billion for the democracy-building programs in Ukraine since its independence. Russian propaganda has used this statement to create a perception that this big sum has been sent specifically to fund the revolution in Ukraine, which is absolutely untrue. The money has been spent over 22 years, the bulk of which has been given to government agencies for state-building projects, reforms, and so on. Russia received similar assistance to the tune of tens of billions of dollars. So, while the West undoubtedly supported the protest movement carried out by pro-Western political and societal forces, there is no evidence of their direct meddling in Ukrainian politics during the Revolution of Dignity. What about the attitudes of the Ukrainian people towards the Euromaidan? According to the poll conducted in October 2014 by the Ilko Kucherev Foundation for Democratic Initiatives, 20% of Ukrainians took part in the Euromaidan demonstrations throughout the country. It is also important to note that although the level of support to the Euromaidan has increased since 2014 in Ukraine, particularly after the start of the war, at the time almost half of the population opposed the movement. These are Ukrainians living in the south and east of the country, regions with a predominantly Russian-speaking population with industrial links to Russia, who have been living inside the Russian cultural and information space. They preferred closer ties with Russia, which has been used by Putin to start a war on Ukrainian soil in 2014. But still, a lack of support for a popular movement among different groups of people does not make it a coup. There are simply no examples of unanimous support for any revolution in history, as there are always groups who prefer the status quo, who support the incumbent government, and have different political goals, and who just simply do not want instability inevitably caused by revolutionary events. Famously, during the American Revolutionary War, up to a third of the free population supported the Congress, a third remained loyal to the king, and a third remained neutral. But we wouldn't call the American Revolution a French-backed coup because of that, would we? And as we mentioned in the video, Russia had interfered in the Ukrainians' affairs much, much more than the West before, during, and after the crisis. What started with an angry but peaceful and relatively small protest against the last-minute decision of Viktor Yanukovych to back off from the association agreement with the European Union in November 2013, eventually turned into a full-scale revolutionary movement in defiance to a violent reaction of his regime, leading to more than 100 deaths and in defense of freedom of the Ukrainian people. Even though the Revolution of Dignity was accompanied by violent events, it does not qualify as a coup, not more than any other famous revolution in history, like the French Revolution or the 1917 February Revolution in Russia. Unfortunately, violence is often the inevitable component of revolutions, as popular forces and incumbent regimes face off, with a compromise not being seen as an option. If you are wondering what a coup attempt looks like, look no further than Prigozhin's so-called March of Justice to Moscow on June 24th. We will talk about the unprovoked Russian invasion of Ukraine more in the coming days, so make sure you are subscribed and press the bell button. Please consider liking, subscribing, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Recently, we have started releasing weekly Patreon and YouTube member exclusive content. Consider joining their ranks via the link in the description or button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our private Discord, and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.